Hi everyone and welcome to the, today's second session of Digital Building Week. So excited to be um, hosting this one. My name is Jordan Marshall and I'm Special Projects Editor at Building Magazine. Um, we've got a great session for you today, which is all about um, you know, the inflationary crunch and how what firms can do to sort of bolster their margins. Um, as we all know, the UK construction sector is currently facing a time of unprecedented inflationary pressure with rising energy prices, an ongoing skills crisis and high interest rates all continuing to impact the industry. Um, we, with clients becoming increasingly cautious about launching new projects, it's more important than ever that construction firms find a way to maximise margins on their existing workbook. I'm really excited about the panel we've got today. We've got a really nice range of views. Um, so I'm really happy to be chairing. Um, first of all, we have uh, Kevin Ping, who's Commercial Director from BW. Um, we have Vimal Nair, who's VP International at QuickBase. Um, and we have Chris Carr, Joint Managing Director at Car and Car and Vice President of the Federation Master Builders. Um, I would just like to run through a couple of housekeeping things first. First of all, we'd love for you to get involved as possible. So please send through your questions at any time and um, we'll try and get those to the speakers as quickly as possible and also cover off as many as, as we can in the Q&A portion at the end. Second of all, I'm already well across the fact that we're going to be covering a lot of ground today. Um, so yes, you can watch this session on demand. Everything is recorded. It will be available via the same link you joined today, free for 12 months across all our websites. That's building, building design and housing today. Um, so please feel free um, to share that link with a colleague if you think it would be useful to them, re-watch, um, catch up on bits. It will all be there within about 30 minutes of the session wrapping up today. Um, that is it from me to kick things off. So first I'm gonna be handing over to Kevin. Um, just making you presenter now, Kevin. Perfect. Thanks, Jordan. Brilliant. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so That's I'm just going to do a quick, yep, all good. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction on, on ourselves. So we're a London based fit out contractor um, operating across the capital and at the home counties, specialising in workplaces um, across various sectors. And we turn over about 225 mil a year and um, through various procurement routes uh, working with various clients. So Looking back at the last 18 to 24 months, really um, a lot of the challenges that we've seen um, in terms of inflation has been naturally driven by the pandemic and the Russian conflict. Um, and that's impacted cost and availability um, in terms of materials, labor and so forth. Um, in terms of how that's come about, um, naturally there's been a lot of pent up demand where we physically couldn't build, um, but also as a, as a a knock-on effect is also what we call panic demand. Um, so a lot of end users, employers, probably rushing to market, seeing that prices are going up, seeing that availability is causing an issue, people are, are, are jumping on it. Um, and, and that's kind of then further exasperating inflation. Um, there's naturally been a strain on businesses and in particular with our supply chain in terms of cash flow, with reverse VAT um, and also pandemic um, assistance being withdrawn. Um, so a lot of that we've seen um, affecting a lot of subcontractors, suppliers, um, and then that's in turn affecting our cost base. So as a knock-on effect um, and as a result of all those inflationary uh, pressures, what we're seeing is that projects are being tendered at a much earlier stage of design, um, especially where projects are being rushed out. And traditionally, we would see projects and tenders at probably a, a REBA stage three, potentially stage four um, design. A lot of things are now being rushed out a lot earlier. So you're seeing a lot of stage two design and more even earlier and concept design coming to market, testing the waters, um, and that's taking up a lot of tendering capacity. Um, and that's affecting not only main contractors, but also supply chain. The compressed and condensed tendering um, is then you know, affecting how projects are going to go into market. So the route to market has changed quite a lot. Um, we used to see a lot of um, traditional jobs with isolated CDP. There's been a a greater shift towards more turnkey design and build, a lot of two-stage um, into the market, which again takes a lot of resource. Um, and naturally, there's been a bit of a, a backlog uh, with inflation um, where client aspirations on budget and also program are having to be adjusted. Um, and then that's introducing a lot of late VE, a lot of post-tender adjustments, which adds further costs onto projects. So it's, it's all to do with the market catching up to where um, things are really. Building on that, naturally there's a, a lot of resource limitations and capacity um, and us as a, as a contractor, but also as a market, we must all adapt unfortunately. And the industry as a whole has always struggled and had a, a looming problem with skilled 
work and um, skilled um, workers, labour, um, and also the demographic of the UK, and uh, where we've got a, a real uh, dip in the next five or so years. If you look at a lot of the ONS stats, with you know. 20 year olds and, and so forth coming into the industry and not just um, the construction industry so what we've identified really is that you know as a market and as, as a business ourselves we really need to embrace technology and innovation to really adapt to that shortfall especially as demand is growing up capacity is dwindling um, and just to really run leaner um, and to use what we've got technology is going to be key to that um, so to summarise that in terms of the challenges that we see, and especially with regards to the fit out market, the shift of design risk and responsibility has really evolved. Um, it's, historically, we've always taken a lot of risk um, in comparison to the rest of the construction industry, but that's evolved even more. Um, more onerous conditions, more onerous payment terms and so forth. Competition has is, is naturally driven things down. Um, so price and time driven um, tender returns we do really have to really um, you know, sharpen our pencils to really get, get into the mix on, on projects. Um, and it's, it's striking that balance where, you know, especially with the fast track nature of what we do, that can be quite risky. Um, and volatility from the market has really led to a lot of slippage and creep. Um, and that's introducing a lot of risk into what we do. Um, so in order to protect our, our, our bottom line um, and, and protect our position as a business, what we've had to do is then review all of these risks and look at how we can really navigate that um, with different strategies and so forth. Um, and things that we've deployed over the past, you know, two and plus years, to be fair, even in the early days of Brexit and, and, and the murmurings of that, we've, you know, strategically taken on more of a lead in terms of design and procurement, um, and especially pushing for early engagement. The earlier that we can get involved on projects, and um, especially at feasibility and cost planning stages, that really helps informs the end users, the consultants and so forth, where the market is heading. Uh, we generally find that we're about at least six to 12 months ahead in terms of price increases and program shifts. So if we can get in early doors and feed that back um, to the right people, that just helps make um, everyone's lives a lot easier. We're also pushing a lot in terms of uh, pre-approving alternatives um, at tender stage. So that maximizes that pre-construction period. So what that kind of means is, we're giving shopping lists on specifications, especially with regards to certain finishes uh, and equipment. And what that allows us to do is, as and when there is an issue, we can pivot really quickly. Um, and that just saves a lot of downtime. So it's all these little efficiencies that we're introducing into our workflow and how we deliver projects, which is really then helping protect our, our position, but also making sure that the project is, is not only a success for us, but also the end user. And um, it's just getting rid of those bottlenecks that you find. Um, a lot of the times what we found was we'd return tenders and suddenly the project is, is completely over budget or the program's not viable for the end user and it's going through a heavy value engineering session which can you know take easily six to eight weeks um, and that comes with it time and money um, and that just affects um, the bottom line for everyone really um, so really it's just finding those efficiencies um, approaching two stage differently and um, so naturally with projects coming into into play at a lot earlier stage in design we're having to approach the two stage process um, in a more efficient manner so what we're doing is we're we're taking a view on, on certain packages and um, so between design stages there's unlike there's be a lot of shifts in, in certain disciplines for example raised flooring and what we do and um, so we generally propose to commit to certain packages early doors and that just helps negate the, the lengthy two-stage process which can add time to, to what we do um, and fortunately for us you know due to our track record and our relationships we're negotiating a lot of work with repeat clients so 40 percent of what we do is with repeat clients um, and half of that generally ends up being negotiated and um, so that saves us um, and, and, and saves us time and resource especially when it comes to the cost of tendering which i'm sure we'll all agree you know, from consultants to contractors to subcontractors has a has a cost um, and has a real resource strain. So the more that we can negotiate and the more trust that we can build with our you know supply chain and also the clients and the consultants, that really makes the process a lot lot a um, lot more efficient. So what this you know looks like and what the future should really bring is really driving home that early engagement. Um, you know, it kind of ties back into a lot of the, the the reports from the 90s and so forth 
it's, it's partnering with people both upstream and downstream and just really unlocking projects and, and collaborating more. The more transparency is and the more um, visual um, transparency and, and clarity uh, that we get on projects um, across the supply chain and also um, with clients, that really helps de-risk projects. Um, greater application of data, um, and that's something that we, we really try and drive home all the time, especially with efficiencies. We generally find that a lot of construction can be very transactional. It's almost as if you know, we're trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, and it's just finding those efficiencies, making things quicker. And when you try and explain you know, the, the fit out market, especially to people outside the industry, it, it does baffle them. Uh, you know, where a consultant does a, a cost plan and then four or five contractors have to almost guess what that cost plan is and try and be the most competitive and then try and procure all that. It's, it's a very strange process and it makes no sense really when you think of it that way. Um, collaborating more throughout the design and tendering process, seeing the tendering process as more of a pre-construction period and using that as a due diligence um, check is really key. Um, and really just tying back to what I talked about with regards to negotiation, looking at alternative ways to procure projects. Um, in a strange way, the best route to market and the best way to procure a project, I always say to, to end users and consultants, is to negotiate. Um, but unfortunately, the barriers to that is trust. Um, and the more that people can learn to trust each other and work together and not be greedy and not, you know, complicate things, um, the better that we can make um, the build process, the tendering process and construction overall. Um, and that's really it from me. So I'll pass it back to Thank you so much, Kevin. That was such a great start and such a good overview to kick things off. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from Jamal. I'll give you the presenter access now. And you should have that now. And we just have had this come in a few times. It must have been from people who um, joined a couple of minutes late. But yes, um, there's no issue um, with anybody. <laughs> Sorry, there's no issue with anybody who um, wants to rewatch this afterwards. Um, you can definitely catch up. So um, yes, Mal, um, I'll hand over to you. Do you have my screen visible? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Jordan, and uh, uh, very excited to be here. This is Vimal Nair here. Uh, I lead the international business with QuickBase outside of the US Canada market. So jumping right into the topic, Kevin, a great start for me, a good segue for me to sort of build a topic out. Um, the graphic on the left side sort of reiterates most of what both Jordan and, and Kevin talked about. There are a lot of macroeconomic and geopolitical factors that are in play around us. And if you really look at it, most of these are much beyond our control. And, and for businesses and individuals, uh, the best course of action is to sort of accept these risks and work around it. And while we say that, um, there's still a lot of factors and several other factors in, in play which are much within our control. And these, when taken care of at the appropriate time, will help avoid wasteful and mistake-based spends. I think Kevin touched upon that uh, multiple times across his presentation. Now, when you do these on time, the, there's a significant amount of saving that you can generate, and this will result in a faster time to market for your end customers, which will then in turn help customers generate more revenue. That revenue and profitability then gets plugged back into the business in the form of new investments and new projects. And this is essentially all of us what, what we're looking for in the industry, more investments and more opportunities. Now let's examine uh, some of these factors on the right side of the screen, uh, project management being the top most amongst of them all. Each one of us who has ever worked on a large project, particularly in a large construction project, we are very familiar how difficult and challenging it is to organize and control all aspects of a large project like that. Now, whether it be material, labor, coordinating contractors and subcontractors, quality issues, legal, government, councils, it's a nightmare. And you still are required to deliver a project on time, on budget, on schedule. Now, when you do such a complex activity, it's quite normal and usual, therefore, that you tend to overlook some of these small delays or gaps here and there. You might have commonly heard people saying, you know, what a week of delay in the material arriving on site. I, I don't care. I can wait for it because I got my team waiting on something else. They can do something else while we wait. Or, you know what, a few more delay in a decision is not going to kill me. Or, you know, I really don't know when part B and part C is going to come, but I will work on part A and I'll get it completed. And I'll get moving on to the next part of the work. 
Now, while this might sound very small and silly, in reality, each of these smallest of factors, they all result in huge amount of rework, delays, aggregation issues, and a lot of data loss in the process. And all of these, trust me, eventually adds up and compounds and comes back to bite us at a later point of time. Now, statistics sort of reconfirms this observation that um, a large amount of our profit margins are severely impacted by these factors. McKinsey found that around 77% of mega projects are delivered 40% late. Cost of bad data is about 1.8 trillion pounds. And, and this is the result of poor decision making. 14% of rework is resulting in about 89 billion pounds of additional losses. And, and interestingly enough, most of these construction players do not have a technology strategy or a data strategy in place. And this is a huge opportunity for the construction industry as a whole. And if you address these challenges ahead of time, by identifying these gaps in whether it be communication, workflow, processes, data connectivity, and if you solve for them now, when in future the industry turns around and when the macroeconomic conditions improve, there will be a huge amount of leverage that each of you as com uh, construction company industry experts will be able to leverage. Now, if you really look at these factors on the screen here, these are all about data. And, and Kevin talked about data as an important element. These are either due to lack of visibility of data or, or due to data existing in silos or not being collected properly, or a need for real-time data and visibility across the system so that you can make real-time informed decisions. And you need to solve for them now. And as, as, you, as you solve for them now, you would see that you will be poised for accelerated growth. And with the right tool sets, you can actually scale to meet the increased demand for your booming business as and when the economy improves. So let's look at where these really the gaps are and how do we sort of start to plug them. The depiction sort of shows the construction project lifecycle across various stages. Um, and if you really look at the, there are so many places where faulty and non-existent data integrations between systems could result in misinformation and a lot of money being wasted. Uh, for example, uh, I'll, I'll take a simple brick and mortar example. If you have got your mortar created and a and, and the amount of bricks available for your construction is not available, it's gonna go down as a drain waste and you cannot probably reuse it somewhere else. And if you think of uh, the similar situation between a pre-con stage and a procurement stage, the procurement has to uh, wait for a plan to be available to go ahead and procure, but they don't have the information on time. So they go ahead and procure something else with a different uh, specification, which then maybe needed to be returned or rebuilt all of these are costing significant wastage, overspend, and possible rework. But with a connected, well-connected data sets, universal visibility throughout your entire project life cycle, construction leaders like yourself could gain immense amount of insights and proactively manage your challenges, iterate on your processes, and make informed business decisions which will ultimately reduce revenue losses and then increase your profit margins. I'll, I'll spend a few minutes explaining how QuickBase can help here. QuickBase really is a no-code app development platform. What we provide is a capability where organizations can see, connect, and control complex projects and programs that reshape our world. What we mean by see is that you can see every detail of your project, even as your size and complexity grows. It allows right people to see the right things at the right time. It connects, which means it connects data from your enterprise business systems and avoid and removes um, information gaps. It allows you to connect between your existing Oracle, SAP, or whatever core systems you have, and still not having to throw it off and be able to use your existing investments and use QuickBase as a layer, a single uh, pane of reference to be able to orchestrate information between multiple platforms and still be able to make those decisions. That's the power of QuickBase. Control is essentially controlling access to sensitive project data. QuickBase allows you to control access to both your in-house and external employees, contractors, as well as uh, employees. Uh, you will be able to get uh, role-based access so you can securely and safely scale your application and focus on your business and grow it. And we are particularly good, uh, good in built environment. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with built environment, built environment sort of collectively refers to 
a collection of large sectors that need complex project management. It includes development and maintenance of everything, literally from buildings, parks, green spaces, neighborhoods, cities, and, and sort of the infrastructure required to access them like roads, railroads, water supply, or energy networks for that matter. Built environment, interestingly, uh, which is where the construction industry belongs, is, is where it's a laggard in the, in the technology space. It's where I think less than 3% of the capital spend is allocated towards tech and R&D. There's a huge amount of fragmentation on top of that uh, for a building construction. Statistics suggest there are about 50 different entities that has to work together for you to build up a huge uh, building tower, for example. This kind of complexity creates a huge void of innovation and technology gap, and this is a huge opportunity. The market right now is absolutely ripe for digital transformation. QuickBase can help you build a fully functional and integrated solution with capability for you yourself to rapidly build out uh, use cases, uh, connectivities, functionality without having to go to an IT developer so remember quickbase is a no code application development platform which means you do not write code to develop what you want to develop you will be using our visual development engine dragging dropping and connecting all you need to know is what your use case is what's the flow you need and you will be able to develop it yourself using your own team members and of course there are help outside available in the form of uh, it companies or you know contractors but but you pretty much can do most of it yourself now I just talked about how QuickBase is doing this. Let's let's look at an example of how we have done this in, in one of our customer cases. Consigli is a large US-based construction firm. They've been a customer with us for more than 10 years. Um, their problems are pretty much similar to what I said. They used large amount of Excel sheets, Excel data files. They have too many number of projects running. They had no visibility across their applications, across their project. They didn't know where materials were available, where resources were available, which project was in red or which one was in green. They had complete issue of data silos being formed with new new point solutions being added. New point solutions is like, let's say you buy a Procore or, a, or any other uh, software solution that you want, SAP, Oracle, etc. But you're not connecting them together, which means you don't have information available with you. And with QuickBase, what they were able to do is to build a suite of applications, which is then now connecting every one of these systems together and they are able to see uh, they are able to get notifications they are able to make decisions let's say if you have a uh, brick and mortar example you have brick available in one side you you have mortar available in another side you're able to connect these two information and, and ship brick to another site and make sure that the uh, things are not going waste and and that has resulted in them now delivering uh, almost all of their projects on time and, and ahead of schedule and this has resulted in increased customer satisfaction resulting in repeated business we believe there's a huge opportunity for every one of you in this call to leverage this. We look forward to talking to you and that's where I'll stop right now. Back to you, Jordan. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was such a good level of insight. Before you go, Vimal, sorry, I just have a quick question that's come in that I'll ask you while I'm still happy. If you can come back, please. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask, there was a question around, obviously you've mentioned there that idea of data silos and you know um, how that, one of the, one of the questions that we've had is are there specific common causes of data, data silos that you see and does it occur in one type of business more than um, others see what what traditionally happened is that whenever you face a problem you tend to look for a solution then and there right what what you end up doing is uh, you are in the field of you're, you're facing a problem you end up facing the problem therefore you end up solving the problem without going for a central solution for the company as a whole and what that does is you in either introduce a new point solution, which means you go out and buy a software, or you create your own solution. Let's say you use an Excel and write a macro and you create your own solution. Each of these are not taken centrally as a center of excellence and then delivered back to all projects equally. Therefore, these silos, once gets created, they are not available to anybody else's learning, not even for the management. So yes, data silos gets created because there is no orchestrated data strategy, connecting data, connecting systems is not at the front of, or, or, or not in the minds of the leaders in a construction industry. They are not thinking through and creating those data strategies and IT strategies. And that is a common factor we are seeing across built environment industries, particularly construction. And that's where I said, uh, 
the industry has been a laggard and, and and this is where we see a huge opportunity for companies to adopt technology and, and be able to build those uh, connectivity layers of visibility brilliant thank you so much okay um i'll have more questions for you but i'll wait till after chris has um, done his little presentation so uh chris i'll hand over to you thanks jordan yeah hi i'm chris carr and i'm a managing director of a small family business based in lincolnshire it's fourth generation going over 100 years and we have different impacts on our business uh, that probably can't be picked up by some of the, the conversations we just early, had earlier on. I've been in the business for, say, uh, 30 years, 15 years as band director, but I also sit on the Federation of Master Builders, the CITV board, and uh, the construction, leaders, uh, construction Leadership Councils on several of their groups from housing to products availability. So I've got a broad understanding of, of what the impact is on our, our companies at the moment. And in the 30 years of industry, I've never known anything times like these uh, with Brexit, COVID and wars in Europe. You know, it's the perfect storm. But as a small, small family business, we're a large percentage of my company uh, turnover is on new housing, speculative new housing. And so what we can do on there is, is, is buy as cheap as possible uh, labour and materials without compromising on quality and then sell for what the market value um, is at the time. But when we come to other parts of the business, we have a slight, we have a contracting side of it, uh, which takes on things like um, heritage work and um, listed building work, which again needs the, the clients there need, need a fixed price. But the trouble is I can't deliver a quotation with certainty and stick to it. The trouble is, you know, the forecast for purchasing materials in four to six months time, that where the price, the price increase is such to appear at such a rapid rate and such big increases, I mean, we received an email today saying that you know, materials have gone up, um, you know, cement 13%, bricks 20%, pavers 22%, bathroom fittings 44%. How can I build that into a program for my company? So we can see where real-time visibility can help businesses and increase the margins. But with such a volatile material and labour market at the moment, we've got to find different ways to improve, uh, improve our margins. So what we do, like with many smaller builders that uh, are SME, uh, sorry, FMB members, we look at something different. And one of the things we look at is managing waste. Um, you know, having tradespeople understand that not all offcuts of timber, insulation, bricks, et cetera, should go into skips. You now we recycle surplus, uh, surplus materials uh, as much as we can, and it's a thread that runs through the whole business. We deliver all our timber offcuts to a local guy who cuts them, regularizes them, and then sells some people wood burners. We have a company that picks up our polystyrene and reuses them for uh, compacts of polystyrene, makes them for window, uh, sorry, for uh, picture frames for wixes. We have cardboard collected and recycled. Bricks and concrete gets crushed and recycled. We have a local WhatsApp group with local other developers where we can transfer waste soil between sites when and when and ever we need it through licensed um, with licensed carriers. So we don't have to go into skips. So not only does that this more make us more sustainable, but massively reduces the amount of skips we require on site and that reduces what goes to a landfill. But this also reduces our overheads and increases our margins. The other one is labour and working environment. Good quality trace people are very hard to find, so we make every effort to keep them with us. We found that it's not always about the money either. We find that the work environment, both physically and mentally, can be far more, far more important for older trace people than the money. Uh, if, I mean, I praise them for good work, but some things managers and owners of companies we don't do very often is, is praise our trade people. We invest in new infrastructure, uh, welfare facilities. We, we make sure everyone's got bottled water. We have uh, ample supplies of coffees, teas. It's, it's the little things that cost very little and make such a big impact on a person's environment. And I've also invested in time to get to know the individuals, know about the families, the sports, the hobbies. Because we also find if you go around and speak to them once a week, just have a chat about their families, their sports. You know, my wife says, you know, you're all the time looking at football and Formula One results when you don't like either. But it's about engaging with the people on site and making them feel part of a team. And we're finding a notice when they're taking more pride in their work, that their environment, their environment they're working, and the subcontractors are staying more loyal to this company. And I'm getting far more productivity out of them, which improves my margins. The final one we look at is transparency. We've decided to improve the lines of communication, be more transparent with regards to pricing to our clients. We regularly send out the, the Construction Leadership Council's product availability, product availability statement out to our clients, and this explains the issues with regards to availability and how the prices have increased. So it's a neutral, independent paper. 
with an offer our clients an open book alternative for fixed quotes. We work this with adding 20% margin on all materials, 10% margin on our subcontractors, and hourly rate for debt to, uh, directly employed tradespeople. This gives us a guaranteed margin and the customer a guaranteed job where they're not looking over the shoulder to see where we're cutting corners. It's surprising how many customers prefer this, but the trust must be there for both sides. If there's a saving on labour or material costs, then we're happy to pass it on. And most of our work comes with repeat work from working with these clients. I know I've got a bit off script with regards to exploring how real-time viability for building projects can increase margins, but hopefully it gives you an idea what the smaller and micro builders have to do to improve their margins in these very strange times. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. That was another great presentation to another perspective for the sector. Um, can I ask our other two panellists to please pop your cameras back on, turn your mics back on, and we can jump into the Q&A. To our audience, please do send through your questions for the speakers. We'll try and cover off as many of those as we can now for you. Um, but to kick things off, I have a question that I think, Mel, I'll put to you in the first instance, but then obviously if anybody else has thoughts, please just jump in as well. Um, so we're, we're just want hoping that you can answer this for our audience. Um, how can we better overcome the disconnect between field staff and office staff when it comes to project delays? I'll take it first. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so um, it's very interesting. Uh, you talked about this one. Um, we've been seeing um, multiple projects like this. One example quickly coming up around is AT&T in the US. Um, they use our software to stand up their uh, mobile towers across the country in the US. And, and invariably what we uh, learned is that uh, they have a huge amount of field staff, some of them who are not really part of the company, it's the extended staff who are from a different subcontractor. And um, uh, they have employees within the company who are managing them or scheduling them for the work. Now, earlier, they never had a system of control where they would give them a schedule, a roster, and somebody could pick a roster and say, I am available for this time at this, this venue. And, and therefore, it all used to be on phone calls or uh, emails and, and invariably sometimes it gets lost in translation and some people don't turn up on time and you don't have any backups available and so on and so forth. So with what, what we solve the problem with is a, is a single application which is accessible on mobile uh, both for the contract staff as well as the employees in the company. They both get role-based access to our platform so they get different screens on what they see. So somebody will uh, pro send across like an Uber uh, a ticket saying you know, we need 10 staff available in this site to erect a tower, let's say. And people who are available in that station in that neighborhood could choose and say, yes, I am available. And they say yes. And, and maybe uh, the previous night they fall sick. They can then now tell, OK, I'm unavailable right now. Uh, that slot gets open somebody else. So I'm just giving an example of how one company solved it. But that's a good good example for you to learn from that. Um, the, your field staff or, or the people who are contract staff doesn't have the same amount of technical know-how, some are blue collared, some are white, white collared work staff. Their aware, awareness to knowledge, technology is very different. So if you enable them using a very simple solution without having to go through complex processes, you are then uh, having real-time visibility. It comes back to the same point of real-time visibility of information of availability of staff in which location to what requirement and what's the skill level of that staff. So we could provide all that in, a, in an application and say in this region there are you know, 100 workers with skill level A and 50 workers with skill level B. So both the uh, office side as well as the worker side, they are able to manage themselves and you know, collaborate in real time. Absolutely. Do anybody else have any thoughts on that on that question that we want to chime in? Or shall I move on to the next one? <laughs> um, we have, so one of the other questions that um, we had come in is, so how do you manage um, that that visit and this is probably you know how do you manage that visibility when it's a broader supply chain obviously you know construction has traditionally had some issues with information and data sharing across com not only in, within companies but also across different um companies um maybe kevin you were speaking about um you know data and the importance and obviously you know you work as part of a supply chain are, are there challenges in other ways that can be overcome yeah, it's, you're right. I think it's that transparency um, across the supply chain. Um, and it's, it's really what we find is it's time. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you're, you're, you're rushing into 
a tender for us um, used to take, you know, six to eight weeks. Now we're seeing tender turnarounds, you know, being reduced to about four weeks. Um, and then likewise, mobilization periods used to probably be about six weeks before we'd hit site on a, say, a 30 week project. Um, and now, you know, mobilization and, and pre-construction could be squeezed down to two weeks. Um, and really that that time is really hampering and that data knowledge and sharing. Um, so the more time we're given, the better. And what we've actually found is when we've done studies on it, and we, we did a white paper recently, is that ironically, if you extended your pre-construction period and allowed yourselves more time to kind of coordinate and um, you know, design out you know, scope gaps and so forth, the overall project duration is actually the same, um, if not quicker, but the cost base could actually reduce um, and that cost you know, saves a lot of time. Um, and I think that's the irony of it, where there's such a, a rush to, to start on site and to see progress that sometimes that could be a detriment um, and really that allowing yourselves more time to design can design out a lot of risks, allows you to procure better um, and it allows you to share data and more effectively. Absolutely. Do anybody else have, have any thoughts on that one that they wanted to add? I'm just saying, I mean, it's a bit different for a family business. Communication is fairly, fairly easy. Um, but we do look for visibility. I mean, I'm now based on site, my larger site, because I didn't want to be in an office miles away. So I thought, no, I'm going to be on site. Um, but also uh, the supply chain, we, we insist that all our supply chain, which includes the architects and engineers, we meet by Zoom and Teams. I won't do it by email. I will not do it by phone calls. I want to see the visibility. I want to see that that we can have a conversation like we're having here and get things sorted out quickly rather than progressing and delayed. And we find that that's the best way forward now is meetings as and when we need them as quick as possible and solutions sorted. Absolutely. We've had another um, question coming from the audience. So um, as we understand the urgency of digitizing the way the construction business is conducted, are there any specific parts of the business which are a good point to start with? Um, and also, are there any specific subsectors, e.g. fit out, fair shower, warm shower, or interiors that are, you know, a prime place to start? Or is it something for everybody? Like, should we be looking to do this? Can you only digitize one part of a business or is it implicit that you need to sort of go all in if you're going to do it? <laughs> um, anybody want to jump in first or shall I pick on someone? <laughs> I can start and then I'll, I'll let the others speak as well. Uh, see, project management is the fundamental aspect of it all, right? If you are able to have a handle of your project management, uh, you know, you, you look at the cost, budget, schedule, uh, quality as, as three, I mean, three broad spectrums. Your ability to control cost without having to cut corners, ability to be able to deliver on time with the right quality, your Schedule management and project management could be the start point. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the uh, subsequent downstream stages. Now, within that, um, a lot of information sharing simply happens using technology. And, and, and Chris talked about it. You're already talking technology in terms of uh, Zoom meetings. You're pretty much digitized there. Your earlier meetings would have been in person only, and now you're already doing it on Zoom, which means you're digitized. You're already on the path. Now, how much more do you want to adopt? Yeah, I would, I would suggest start with project management uh, once you have a handle of your project management have an application or have a bunch of applications which are available both on mobile and on your desktop uh, you could then look at individual pieces of the puzzle I mean, of course there are a lot more technologies like digital printing etc which you probably want to take it down the line but yeah you start off at project management that's my recommendation do anybody have any other thoughts um, on our side, I think we, we kind of looked at it slightly differently where like, you know, we've got about 275 employees, um, 150 of that is probably, you know, the core crux of it is delivery teams on site and um, construction site. Uh, we actually started more focusing on all the ancillary departments because one, they're smaller um, and they're generally easier to, to adapt to. Um, and then by approaching those, you know, things like estimating finance, um, back of house, um, if, you, if you want to call it that, those departments were really quick to digitize because um, naturally a lot of their work is digital anyway. Um, so it's really like fixing those efficiencies and then allowing that to kind of scale up and then adapting those technologies, you know, like document sharing and so forth into the operational side. Um, I think from, from our side, what we've seen as well is not rushing into it um, and, and doing it in phases. So we would generally, if we want to approach certain um, 
changes we would do it in you know two or three different phases uh, with a roadmap over say 24 months um, and we'd take it in chunks um, because naturally i think uh, and and it's not just construction i think people are scared of change um and when you take away certain things like you know if you start if you took away excel for example away from all the the surveyors they'd probably um, find it very uncomfortable um so it's just kind of taking things in, in stages absolutely okay um the next question i was going to ask is sort of like looping back to the um overall topic but one of the things that we um sort of set out that we were going to try and cover at the start um were you know the challenges and bar barriers to you know these measures that we're talking about and i sort of thought you know Chris, you've sort of outlined some of the ways that SMEs are, you know, trying to cope, but what are some of the specific barriers? So I was sort of thinking, Chris, I might ask you to sort of talk about it from like your perspective and then Kevin from your perspective and then Vamal from yours. What are some of the challenges that you see, but also how are those challenges being overcome? Because then it's, you know, a bit more of a productive conversation for the audience than us just telling them the problems without any solutions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the biggest part of this is volume. We don't have um, we, we can't get the volume for either materials or labour or, or finance to allow materials and labour. So uh, we, we, you need to keep feeding the animal, you need to get bigger and bigger. It's a lot easier for the bigger companies. So we, we kind of struggle with that digitalisation. We, we need to absorb that, but at the moment, the way we're going with the future home standards, which is new government policy that's coming in uh, about three years' time, I work on that group, and we're struggling to deliver any houses to, to what we build, the high quality end houses and the bungalows. So we're going to now have to look at MMC, Modern Methods of Construction, to deliver it because we won't be able to deliver it in a standardised way for the volumetric, the volumetric market we need. So it's, it's going to be quite an interesting um, times ahead, but the only solution we can find is literally, um, for, for new housing, is, is that literally a supermarket, it will be an Asda, you will pick a house off a thing and put it on one of our plots. Um, so there's the solution. I'm not sure it's the right solution, but I can see it's possibly the one we're drifting down. Absolutely. Um, Kevin, did, what was your thought? I think in terms of challenges um, and, and uh, obstructions, I guess, it, it, it's like I said, it's probably the, the apprehension towards change. Um, so it's finding that middle ground. Um, I think if you if you look back, you know, for example, BIM is a, is a great case in point where you know, we've been talking about BIM and 3D for, you know, 20, 30 years almost. Um, and you know, even even when I was at, um, at uni, I thought when I came into, into the working world, it would everything would be digitised. Um, it just takes a bit of time. And um, so what we generally find is really finding hybrid solutions or partial solutions where you're not completely foregoing, um, you know, tried and tested methods. Um, so, you, you know, for example, with us, we do do a lot of BIM and 3D modelling, but it'd be on certain aspects and packages. Um, it's applying things effectively and not trying to reinvent everything completely. And um, that's what we generally find works more, most effective and it's probably more cost effective as well. Brilliant. Um, Demel, for you, I might just phrase the question slightly differently if that's okay, just because specifically what you've like showed to us so um, well is you know that real importance of that real time data share. And so I suppose, one, and, and you have covered this in part, but one of the things that I was um, sort of hoping that we could reiterate for the audience, um, the, what, are, what do you see as like the core challenges to that real time data share? Um, you know, on top of, you know, the floating documents and people not having that centralized system, are there other barriers that you see, like does construction have an issue with that attaining the correct data and that sort of stuff in the first place? And how are some of those being overcome? The data collection is, uh, I think uh, Kevin talked about it. Now, um, construction industry traditionally has not been very savvy and therefore the methods of collection of information itself has been a problem. Um, and, and as Kevin said, um, you can't fit one size into all. It, it is not a uniform principle that you can apply everywhere. Uh, for a family business, the method is a different one. Uh, we're working with a very large facilities management company based in the UK right now. They are looking at rolling out an application for about so 70,000 employees, um, where these employees are uh, blue collared workers who are not much tech savvy. Now, your solution to them and the solution approach to them has to be significantly different. They can't be given an APK file, which is a technical term to say and go and download something and install. So the challenges and barriers if you specifically look for is the um, the kind of workforce that you're dealing with 
the kind of practices that you've traditionally been following, choosing the right ones amongst that to look at digitization, see the impact of that change, see if it is measurable and or not, see and, and measure it and see if it is adding value to your overall process, which is invariably is expected to do, and then sort of extending that to a wider chain. Now, the, uh, the same thing, you know, enterprise could be very different. We may decide to do a big bang with a, you know, you do a pilot in one country or in one department and then extend it to other, other departments. With a family business, you may do it in a part. In a mid-sized business, it will be totally different hybrid approach. You do uh, you know, both Excel and, you know, phone call or, or, or things like that. So, yeah, that, that's a high level view that I'll share with that. Right. Um, Chris, this one's probably... Um to you in the first instance, because like with as you have a number of roles on like overarching bodies, it would be sort of interesting to get that perspective. Um, but do you see like a big variance in the way firms are attempting to tackle some of these problems? And you know, do you see things that work? Do you see some that just aren't working and some that you know are? <laughs> yes. I mean, the government using me as a disruptor, so I have to go on these panels to to stop the just the, the big voice being heard because a lot of the companies I work with are, are, are PLC volume house builders and I represent the SME sector. We have a completely different agenda, a, a completely different set of uh, issues. Um, the future home standards is predominantly drifting on to work for the PLC companies or for the larger developers. They can achieve it by doing a regularized product over and over, repeated over and again. We can't do that. Uh, we have to differentiate ourselves in the market from those, from those guys. So it, everything we do is so much more difficult uh, to do it, but the government do understand, and all the other groups, you know, the CITV and everybody else I work with, do understand we're a different market, a different issues, and we have to cater for all. We can't just cater for one type, otherwise we'll become an industrialized housing sector. We'll be run by four companies over the UK, and we can't have that. Um, so it is difficult, but it crosses from, you know, we, we train the most in, uh, young trainees uh, through doing the SME sector, are buying we can't buy as much we don't get the rebates of the national do so the costings are different but the main worry for me at the moment is the future home standards is trying to deliver new future home standards which at the moment possibly eliminates things like bungalows and large detached houses it just can't work okay no no thank you for that um Bimal, this one's for you um how significant is support because obviously we've just you've discussed real time you know someone saying we need this many people in this area now who's available um how we've had a question come in about the significance of real time data versus a, a lot of the ways things are traditionally managed where it's like everyone inputs at the end of the day it gets processed at some point and then how much efficiency can be gained by the real time aspect do you find um again volume matters but uh, I'd say we've seen customers talking about 30 to 40 percent of cost savings just by ensuring that information on availability of talent and skills in the right place is available commonly. Just that alone saves 30 to 40 percent of uh, money lost in opportunities, um, money lost in rework, and, and a myriad of things which are associated drag, you know, level revenue losses because of all that. You have to spend time in scheduling, rescheduling, all of that. So ballpark figure 30 to 40 percent straight away you, you save if you're able to digitize some of these aspects of information availability. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to give you guys a heads up now. I'm going to ask each of you for your two big takeaways um, in a few minutes. I'm going to cover up a few questions first, but your big two big takeaways for the audience, just because I love to leave everyone with the overarching messages. Um, but, but I would um, just quickly like to ask as well. Um, in terms of um, inflationary pressures, obviously we've covered off, you know, skills, we've covered off materials. There's also obviously energy, which is an issue at the moment for everybody. Are there other things that, you know, firms should be aware of that you're finding that maybe aren't like making headlines to the same extent? And you know, any solutions you have for those would be wonderful, though I don't suppose anybody has too many energy crisis solutions. I think we... In the housing sector, we've been pushed more on the energy efficiency than than most. Um, but you've got to look at, are you talking energy efficiency? Are you talking uh, zero carbon? Or you, th th There's kind of badges for everything, but that don't all mean the same. And I think sometimes you get driven down a, you know, a zero carbon route, but actually the house is not that energy efficient if you're taking inverted carbons. So, you know, we are going along the route of uh, designing better houses, 
and delivering better quality homes, energy efficient. But I think we need to look at the existing housing stock if we're going to really make a big dent in our energy usage in the UK. And it's, it's, it's our old properties, we're an old country, houses a couple of hundred years old. That's where we need to be to spending our time and, and money doing it rather than the new builds and on the commercial side. The commercial side's completely different. I think they're, they're geared up for it. Um, they seem to do a far, a far ahead of housing. No, absolutely. Um, oh, sorry, my question pane just disappeared. Hang on, let me pop it back up. Um, <laughs> I was halfway through reading a question and it just disappeared. Um, there we go. Uh, so um, this one's for Vimal. It was along that um, point of, um, you know, you were talking about, was it at and in the, the US? Um, is, do, you, do you find that, they, you know, those sorts of apps work best for those companies that ha are at that sort of scale? Or do you, can you see applications across the, across the supply chain? No. So I was just giving as an example, just which is easy to relate to, right? As if you tell Amazon and their warehouses, the simple story of Amazon warehouses is that they need to construct warehouses local to where the demands are so that they can do prime delivery on the same day. So Amazon needs to make about 800 warehouses across the US. That's a complex project management use case where you need to have you know the construction of the warehouse moving the supply material etc so that is just an example to tell you how this can be done and this has been done in, in other customers but the same thing for a small um, solar you know in, in, in installation specialist based out of one of the counties or you know, within london itself it's the same application you know in a use case like a solar installation where you have so many external and internal stakeholders like the plumber the government uh, the project team, the material has to reach on time. You have to coordinate with so many different people and there is no software out there available which can give you a solution straight out of the box. The only way for that then is for you to sit and write a project, a software project, which will take you a year of time and maybe millions of pounds in, in, in spend. And that's not the way to go about it. Uh, the new, new trend in the industry is low code, no code. That's where we play. So you use a platform like ours you are able to build the same thing that you otherwise would have spent six months to one year in a matter of maybe three to four weeks. You drag and drop and connect and build that application. You are not going to spend for the entire software development. You are only spending for the platform. We price you for the platform and the license that you use. You can build using one license 50 to 100 applications at a time. That's not charged differently. It's all charged for one subscription of one license. So if you are a 20 member company or a 50 member company or a 100 member company, you buy those many licenses only. You don't need to buy like an AT&T 100,000 or a Walmart 500,000, what you need. And then you build your application. You, put, you don't need 100 applications, no problem. You build your two applications. Make sure that those two applications are available to your 20 employees. And those 20 employees are able to make efficiencies and therefore you can then add more applications to it like you said finance or you know uh, contractor management or you know contract life cycle management it could be hr you could have any number of use cases being brought onto our platform and and that would cost you you know in in, in five thousand less than five thousand kind of uh, price points if you look at a very small purchase i'm talking about okay Brilliant. Okay, I, um, we're nearly out of time, so I'm going to ask each of you um, if you could give me your two big messages that you'd want the audience to sort of leave with today. Chris, I might get to you first, then Kevin, then Vimal, and then I'll just wrap everything up for everyone. So the two big ones for me are look at sustainability uh, as not as a barrier, but to actually improve margin and transparency to clients, uh, but both public and private sector, so they understand the situation we're in at the moment and you know move our, car, um, our margins accordingly brilliant um kevin uh, for me it's it, it's really just embracing technology um and and just applying it in the most effective manner especially where you know you look at um the lack of people and skills um, and so forth um you know there's simply not enough people um in our industry in the next you know five or ten years aging workforce and so forth so really harnessing technology is going to be key right see my my statement would be to say that saving is the new investment. You know, investments now will come because you save and you create more margin, which will then get ploughed back in the form of new investments for your from your customers. You can you have to do measures to do that saving, and that saving primarily can be led by the digitalization aspects of your business. And digitalization gives you opportunities to save and optimize your 
project schedules, you will not be spending one year, two years, you'll be able to do this in much lesser time. So that gives you more avenues for plowing back your investments in form of other things. So yeah, I'd say saving is a new investment, digitize as much as possible, as soon as possible, so that you are ahead in the race and not waiting for things to happen for yourself. Brilliant. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm conscious I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping matters. First of all, I'd love to say a huge thank you to our speakers. All of you did such a wonderful job today. We can only say thank you so much for taking part in Digital Building Week. Um, we'd also love to say a huge thank you to QuickBase for making this session today possible. It wouldn't have happened without you guys, so we're really appreciative of that. Um, again, thanks to our audience for getting involved and your, all your questions, they're all so welcome. Um, if there's anything else, please do um, get in touch after the session, we'll try and get that passed on to the correct person um, and whatnot. Also, at the end of the session, we have a survey, um, it would literally take you 10 seconds to fill in, but it just makes sure that we're, it just helps us put on more sessions like this that are giving you the information you want on the topics that you need. Um, so if you could please fill that in, we would really be appreciative. Um, finally, it's worth flagging today is only the second day of Digital Building Week. We've got another two days um, of great sessions. We've got them at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. both tomorrow and Thursday. Um, I've got a whole bunch of specialised online content um, specifically for Digital Building Week. Uh, so please feel free to explore that. So that's it from me. Again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Chris, Kevin, Jamal and QuickBase. Um, and that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.